So I just got here because I've had a cold and I still have a cold and I'm like half groggy from having a cold and half from the drugs that I took so I could do this. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Luckily I'm talking about vulnerability and stuff so it's probably good, appropriate, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't expect to be sick and I'm also not allowed to cover the mic or turn off the mic when I cough. So be it warned. <laughs> So, what should we talk about? Rainbows. Uh, unicorns farting rainbows. That's what people expect me to talk about most of the time. Marty said, maybe you want to come and talk about love and software. And I'm like, can you even do that? Like, is that allowed? So, but I will tell you, there's a present. Later on, there's a little bit of code. So, <laughs> so the topic is love. And love to me is um, kind of uncomfortable to talk about. And like I talk about it all the time, that's what I do. And so I imagine you guys find it even more uncomfortable. But also it feels like hubris. I'm about to say, you know, this is what love is. This is what kind of love software needs. And that's, that's hubris. I don't want to tell you what love is for you. So take what works, don't take what doesn't work, right? So soft skills, there's one conference that says, you know, no fluff, no soft skills. And I think, really, why are you scared? <laughs> when the quietest person on the team speaks up, even though they're terrified, even though they're trembling, because they know that something really bad is gonna happen if they don't, I, that doesn't seem soft to me. That seems kind of badass, actually, and terrifying. Like, how many of us avoid times when we could do that? We could speak up, but we don't, because it's too scary. When a parent sits and holds their kid's hand and tells them stories while they sit through their 97th medical treatment, that's not soft, right? It's difficult stuff, and it takes courage to face it. So I'm going to talk about what they call soft skills, and hopefully it won't seem all that soft. When I talk about love, I'm talking about something, it's sort of a technical term for me. If you, if you think about somebody that you care about, or maybe a kid or a pet, a sweetie, and you take a second to really try to picture them in your mind, you feel something in here, right? There's a little spark, something lights up. That thing that lights up is a, is a clue we have this built-in sensor that tells us what brings us joy and what's amazing. And so I'm talking about that when I talk about a heart smile. I'm talking about that sense that you have of the things that bring you joy. And in fact, like a lot of different psychologists have talked about universal human needs or fundamental human needs. You all know about Maslow. And there were some other people, Max Neef, um, Rosenberg. A whole bunch of them have talked about what it is that people need to thrive. And these are things that set off our heart smile. They set off our sense of what love is. These are some of those things. Creativity, we like creating things. We like being cared for and caring for other people. Learning, when I look at learning, it seems kind of dry to me. But when I think about what I've discovered about quantum physics, then it comes back. Then I get the spark, right? Entangled particles, freaking amazing stuff. When I think about discovering um, an algorithm that I hadn't understood before, that kind of learning, that lights me up. Choice, we all like choice. It's something that, about what it means to be human, right? And all these other things, we like energy and we like calm at different times and different places. And there's one down here at the bottom, profluence, profluence that I learned from my friend and mentor, Chipo Hill. Um, and it means progress toward a goal. It's forward movement. Its opposite is when you're sort of on a project that's not going anywhere, or you have nobody to tell you what features are valuable, or your code never gets implemented, or never gets deployed. Profluence is when we're making progress, we're moving forward with what matters to us. And all of these things kind of point to this, this thing that I call geek joy. And when I say geek joy, I'm talking about what is it that made you become a programmer? 
I imagine that everybody here remembers their first program. Yeah? I'm not seeing anybody. Does anybody remember their first program? Cool, okay. <laughs> I can't really see. Um, so I think this might have been my first program. You guys recognize this? Are you all too young? <laughs> Although, actually, I think um, probably it was just the first line that was my first program, and the second line came later. Um, <laughs> and look, it gets better. When I, first, when I first wrote the slide, I had name as input name. And, and my friend was like, we didn't have multi-character variables at the time, and I had forgotten this. <laughs> I had completely forgotten. And then I remember the dollar sign. I was like, dang, OK. So, so when I think about what it felt like the day I wrote this, the day I got to see, you know, I typed something and the computer did something, I was just like blown away. That's like the most amazing thing, right? So that brings us into like how we became this. Like you don't, you don't become a programmer because somebody says it would be a good career choice. I mean, not usually, not for very long, right? <laughs> you have to love it. But then, complexity. Dang it. So we end up in these giant messes, which I think I heard, I miss Sandy talking about messes, which is bumming me out really badly. But um, we end up with this being mired in legacy code with a company that won't let us write what we think we should be writing, and it's like blah, blah. So the geek joy starts disappearing, and we're like, why am I doing this? And then, does anybody know who these quotes are from? Just based on one word, I'll bet you can name them. Bob. That's right, Uncle Bob. Dang. <laughs> so Uncle Bob, bless his heart, I love the man. And I love what he thinks of code. You know, we have the same view of what beautiful code is, except that he thinks that it's driven by fear. And that really breaks my heart. Because I don't think fear works. Like, it's fear that makes us not refactor. Oh, but I have to get this out. Or like, yeah, the customer's going to yell at me or whatever, right? It's fear that makes us not write clean code. So as much as I love him, I really wish he would stop with that. So to me, clean code is about these things. It's about profluence. It's about not living in hell. It's about not building a hell for myself that I have to then deal with, right? Because, you know, I deserve better. I deserve joy. So this is my theory. And it's not that it doesn't also help us, you know, be more pleasant to work with for other people as well. But I'm not motivated by fear of being irresponsible or fear of being unprofessional. I'm motivated by, this is why I code, right? I code because I love to work with systems that make sense, for example. There's this thing I say, uh, why are there shoes in the refrigerator? Because I'm looking at some object setup that has these ridiculous inheritances and these ridiculous, like it, I remember as I'm learning this, I'm, I'm learning, by the way. I started out as an apprentice two years ago. I was coding back in the day, and then I quit for like 20 years. So I came back, and I'm asking my pair, how is, how is a customer a car? Or maybe it was a car a customer. This makes no sense to me. And I ask him like five times, and we go back and forth, and he's like, oh, you mean why does it make sense? It doesn't. And it's because, <laughs> It's because I was working in code that was written out of fear. Like people were not doing the thing that we have this, we have these options for beautiful code that makes total sense and that's what we came here for, right? We didn't come here to write like crap and not clean it up and live with it. That's not why we're here. We could go like build bridges or something. So there's all that complexity, and there are a lot of people here to tell you how to deal with the complexity, but what I want to tell you is why it's worth it, right? That's like, well, let's start with this. So recently, human beings have discovered that we can learn from nature how to deal with complexity. Nature knows how to do that. Nature does these amazing things that we can't even begin to imagine, right? We have brains and like ecosystems. So we're modeling nature now, and we're trying to understand and embrace 
emergence. When we TDD, we teach our code little tiny bits of knowledge, behavior that we want, right? The tiniest we can come up with. And then we let the code tell us what it wants to look like, assuming we're doing the rest of it, the refactoring. And um, J.B. Rainsberger, I don't know if you know him, he's one of my favorite coaches because he loves code. That's beautiful. And he says, if you do these two things, remove duplication and fix bad names, you'll get to like the four rules of simple design or whatever. You'll get to clean object-oriented code. Not that those are easy to do. They take lots of study. They take lots of reading Sandy Metz's book and listening to Justin Searles and whatnot. But we do this because um, we can't hold it all in our heads. When we try to hold it all in our heads, it gets ugly and unpleasant and icky and my heart doesn't smile. And if you try to hold it all in your head, the best you can come up with is the best that you can come up with. And emergence tells us we can do better than that. Nothing? <laughs> I made a slide that says sex and I get nothing. Okay, there's a reason. Sexual reproduction, it occurred to me as I was thinking about this, that sexual reproduction is collaboration, right? <laughs> and I don't, I don't mean collaboration between people. I mean, it's the way that this, this world, nature, right, the, the expert at emergence that we have all around us has figured out to not try to have it all figured out. Well, I'll throw these two things together and see how that works. So I think that's kind of cool. Emergence is when something bigger than the sum of its parts comes out, right? Like, when we cooperate with each other, we both contribute, or we all contribute. When we collaborate with each other, we keep bouncing things back and forth until new things emerge that we've never even thought of, either one of us. I was told if you're gonna make a slide with a bunch of text, you should either read it literally or don't say anything while people read it. What do you think? <laughs> so that moment when you're looking at code with another developer and you're puzzling over it and you can't come to an agreement. Well, they see, they told me not to do that, not to paraphrase. And then something happens that neither of you could have predicted. That's what emergence is. It's a freaking beautiful thing. It's amazing. How many of you have pair programmed? And how many of you have had an awesome experience pair programming at least once? Yeah. Those of you who haven't should meet up with one of those who have and pair, because it's really amazing. This is actually the slide where I'm supposed to say that cooperation is two people doing their own thing, and collaboration is when something new comes of it. So I'll say it again. <laughs> <clears throat> Which brings us back to geek joy. And to the idea that collaboration is love, or it's part of it. It's not all of it, right? Holding a newborn baby, standing on top of a mountain. All those things are also amazing. <laughs> but collaboration is one of them. Collaboration gets me these things. So how do you get to collaboration? How do you get to those kind of heart smiles? I just made that phrase up and it's really a weird one, but I like it. You get there by letting go of keeping it all in your head. Because knowledge needs room to grow. It needs criticism and it needs things to bounce up against. Right? It needs to change, develop. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> it means letting go of getting it right the first time. That means letting go of your need to be right. Letting go of your need to have it figured out. Being able to guess, change your mind. This is a big part of pair programming, is the ability to be, to go down a path that you don't think is the perfect path and see what happens, discover what comes of it. And it means letting go of holding back. As you, 
bring unique things to the to the collaboration, right? You bring your own curiosities, your own confusions, your own questions, and if you're holding back, trying to look smart or trying to uh, avoid conflict, then beautiful stuff doesn't emerge. We don't get the same kind of beautiful code that we get if we're all in. <clears throat> Sorry. Seriously have a cold, it's bad. <laughs> um, so, confident humility is something I talk about when I'm talking about pair programming a lot. And it's something that I think is involved in being able to code with love. The reason I say confident is because you come in knowing that you have something to offer and you bring all of who you are to the work you're doing. And know that emergence doesn't happen without your participation, right? Like ideas have to flow. And so you have to bring everything that you have. And I bring this up because, you know, a lot of us are noobs at something. A lot of us feel like we don't know anything. You know that, that first couple weeks on the job on a project when you spend most of your time trying to not look stupid? Is it just me? I think that's a thing. So confidence means you're willing to be there fully and not hide in a corner and not try to look, you know, not try to not draw attention. But humility means knowing that you're fallible, knowing that every single idea we have is a little bit wrong, right? Like they improve because of that. We have ideas about how physics works and then somebody comes up with something new and we go, oh, there's more to it than we thought. So we're always wrong, but we're always getting closer as long as we're keeping to do this work. It means being curious and investigating. It means listening to the people you're working with, listening to your pair, listening to your team, and then showing up with all you've got. Because confident humility leads us to joyful geekery, which leads us to these things, and code that's infused with love. <coughs> Excuse me. So that is all I've got, and I'm noticing that I have 12 minutes left, for which I apologize. Um, but I'm glad I showed up with my cold anyway. <laughs> so do you guys have comments or questions? Hard to have questions about love and software, isn't it? Yeah. So, what was your first pair programming experience? My first pair programming experience? Yeah, did you love it or, or were you not comfortable with it? Um, <coughs> probably my first real pair programming programming experience was. Um, with a guy who knew a lot and was setting out to correct me <laughs> without doing a very good job of it, without explaining where he was coming from. And I think I went in the bathroom and cried, actually. If I'm thinking of the right one as the first one, I would say I went in the bathroom and cried. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> no, I really am, though, because like I have had some really interesting pair programming experiences, and some that were really awesome, and some that were just horrific. That's why I said that the people who've had good ones should pair with people who haven't, because it makes a huge difference. And the first team I was on, um, I walk into the room, and the super agile superstars who were supposed to be coaching the team were off on their own, sort of, <laughs> coding, because they were experts, and so that's what they had to do. And there was one of the coaches who was sitting next to a, a woman who was working on the team. And he's on his laptop, and she's on the big monitor. And I say, I thought you guys were pairing. And he said, we're doing what I like to call side-by-side -side pairing. <laughs> and he knows who he is, and he constantly berates me for bringing this up. But 
that is what he actually said. And when he explained to me what that meant, it was that she writes the code and asks questions occasionally, and he checks his email or whatever, or does something else entirely. So that's not collaboration. It doesn't create the new stuff. All you get is whatever code she can write by herself, right? <laughs> so glad you brought that up. Yeah. Say again. What did I do? Oh, <laughs> I um, I raised children, um, and I did it. Thank you. I uh, didn't send them to school because I came to see that as a suboptimal way for them to grow. So they stayed home and did what they wanted. Uh, and they all turned out marvelously, by the way. I can tell you firsthand that you do not have to teach children to read. They will learn it by themselves. Um, especially if they have lots of video games. <laughs> <laughs> so then, <laughs> it's true. So, so then, five years ago, I dropped everything. I was doing freelance work and stuff, and I dropped everything to study spirituality. That's actually true. I went to a Zendo every day, and I'm like, I gotta figure this out. So. That's what I did. And two years ago, I came back to code, which I love. Anybody else? Yeah. The guy who made you cry? Yeah. Did he ever become a good pairing partner? You know, he is a, often a good pairing partner. And now I have learned my part of the deal, which I didn't know at the time, which is to grab the keyboard and say, listen, dude, <laughs> sit on your hands and <laughs> talk to me. Like, that's one of the things that, um, confident humility is about is being willing to take your, to take your position, to stand and, and say, I'm part of this, right? So now when I'm pairing with someone and they're like going off and I'm lost, I say, wait, I'm lost. And I feel inside, I'm terrified that I'm slowing everybody down, but actually turns out always that I'm contributing. Anybody else? Yeah. Is Uncle Bob what? Only about here. Only about here? You know, um, he's like, okay, just for, to me, he is like, um, that's how he loves, right? He wants to encourage you to be as good as you can. And I think he doesn't trust that you can do that by striving for love. He wants to make sure that you get discipline. And uh, it's not my approach, but it's his approach. Yeah, I don't, think, I don't think anybody is all about fear. I think we're all about love, except we get scared. Hmm? Challenging? For what? He's trying to be challenging. Oh, he's trying to be challenging, yeah. That's probably true. I know that people love him. Thank you for asking that. How can we learn to be more courageous and less afraid? Part of it's talking to yourself, right? And there's, so in a half an hour, I wasn't able to talk about this very much, but I actually think that um, loving yourself the way you love other people is the answer to that. And that involves sitting with yourself and saying, okay, if my best friend did what I just did, what would I say to them? Would I say, wow, you're a total asshole, like I say to myself? Or would I say, hey, you know, you did the best you could. It's all right. Right? Befriend yourself. Somebody, so the Shambhala Center is right around the corner, right? You could go there. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, Pema Chodron studied there, I think. I don't know how to pronounce her last name. But she writes books about that stuff, and she's a very wise person about befriending yourself. You pretty much have to befriend yourself before you can befriend the world. You want to walk through the world loving. It's got it. You've got to love yourself. And that's like, there's all these calendars with platitudes on them that sound great, but kind of make no sense. That's one of them. But it does make sense. It's just you have to dig and dig and dig. Anybody else? Do you have any tips for pairs that maybe vary a large difference in skill set? You might have a senior, senior person, a very junior person. 
Yeah, do you guys need me to repeat the question or was that? He asked about pairs with different skill sets. Yeah, I do. Um, if you're the senior person, sit on your hands and talk and talk. And if you're the junior person, if you're junior enough, be humble enough to let them tell you every move to make if that's what needs to happen. And then when you're ready to make moves of your own, then say that out loud. But the other thing is you have to, I mean, you have to be brave. You have to say, give me the freaking keyboard. Like after the fourth time you've asked nicely, you have to say, look, I'm falling asleep. Either I'm here pairing with you or I will go do something else, but we gotta, we gotta figure this out. This is why it's not unicorns farting rainbows, right? It's like saying, hey, dude, are you not listening or what? It's about being like loud and serious sometimes. Senior person, sit on your hands. Talk to your pair. Listen to them. Make sure they keep up, because they're going to say to you, they're going to say, is that really the smallest thing you could do, the, the simplest thing that could work? And you're going to be 10 minutes into your brilliant solution, and you're going to go, crap. No, it's not. One thing you get from a junior pair is you get to learn how to get reset hard a lot. <laughs> I know this from being a junior pair. I go, you know, it's been like 20 minutes. Really? Get reset hard. <laughs> Junior pairs, you have a big responsibility. Your responsibility is to say, I need to keep up. We're pairing. Let's do this. That's important. It's really like you have to step up and take the leadership role. People who love pairing, this is a rant that ends my pair programming talk, but I'll end this one too with it. If you love pairing, if you understand collaboration, if you give a crap about emergence, it is your job to go out and share that with people. Because pair programming isn't going to spread as long as people are doing it in a half-assed way or as long as they're not getting good experiences. Right? We're not going to get collaboration to spread unless people who love it and understand it are out there talking about why. So even if you're a total noob, it's your job. Those of you that raised your hands about positive pair programming experiences, it's your job. OK, I'm good. Any other questions? Thanks. <laughs>